so I'm up uh, off Lauriston Place. Hi Marjorie, nice to have you come on. And we are heading for this uh, beautiful building here, which is the Lauriston Fire Station. It's uh, a rather appealing piece of architecture, apart from its function, of course. It's great function in the past as a fire station, but it's no longer that. Today, it's a kind of craft workshop. I've just had a little glimpse of people inside. But you can just imagine these uh, big doorways would be where the fire engines would be uh, coming from. So we'll go and have a closer look at it. This was opened in 1901. Uh, and um, it was designed by the city architect, who was one John Morham, uh, sorry, Robert Morham. So we'll have another little look at it. At the, it's kind of delicate architecture. It's not uh, terribly heavy, and it's in that nice uh, red sandstone, which isn't local uh, to Edinburgh. We are more accustomed to the yellow honey-coloured stone, but this was, uh, because it was later, and we were now getting stone from the west, the southwest of Scotland, bringing it from the Glasgow area. And if any of you have been to Glasgow, hi uh, there, folks. Um, you may be familiar with that as a common building stone. So we'll come in a little bit closer. And I like this plaque here. Uh, it uh, references, of course, that uh, tragic event uh, about 20 years ago. And that I mind it so from Scots, that means always remember it and in recognition of all the firefighters who've made the ultimate sacrifice. And it uh, speaks also about the attack uh, on uh, New York the Trade Centre, as you can see. And this was unveiled a year after that attack. I like the little. Uh, piece of poetry here that says uh, thy work is done thy crown is won go enter into rest no hero falls when duty calls more nobly or more blessed so uh, I'm sure we all you know, share uh, that sentiment now Edinburgh has got quite an important place in firefighting because one James Braidwood from Edinburgh uh, he founded the first municipal fire service and we'll let you have another little look close in at this here and here's a little memorial to James Braidwood he was uh, born in the early part of the 19th century and in the 1820s he founded the municipal fire service and uncannily the great fire of Edinburgh broke out in 1824 and uh, he was quite a sophisticated manager of fighting fires. You can see his details there. Uh, he would um, have a kind of inward knowledge of structures because his father had been a builder and engaged uh, some of the seamen who were accustomed to climbing up masks, masts in the old sailing ships and uh, would be f fleet of foot in the, the old town of Edinburgh should a fire have broken out, which was quite common when many of these buildings back in the 19th century were uh, timber framed, a lot of that, and some of them dating back uh, quite a long time. So um, he was able to have people who would be quite nimble to go from place to place. He was also very aware of how fire spread, and he had a whistle signalling uh, system where he was one of the first to be able to put together certain notes from a whistle that would be held quite far away and would be able to direct the firefighters as to the, the sound of the whistle. Uh, very tragically, well, he went to London and he was part of the fire service in London and uh, there uh, he was uh, in his 60s when he was called out to fight a fire in warehouses beside the Thames in London and a place called Tooley Street and sadly a wall collapsed and he died, uh, James Braidwood. But there again, one of the iconic characters from Edinburgh's past who we remember very much today. Hi everybody and hi Gabriella, thank you very much for coming on and saying hi. And if you look at this tower, you can see part of a tower, part of it has been taken down, but uh, this was where the hoses that would contain the water would be hung. 
so that they would dry out from this uh, hose drying tower. The stone, kind of, you can see it, this sort of uh, stone block effect up there. So we're taking a little walk down here. We're leaving Lauriston Place and uh, you can see more of these red sandstone buildings here. You may see a few art students on the streets here because it's uh, very close to Edinburgh Art College. And Edinburgh Art College building of that dates uh, slightly later than the fire station, but it is also in the red sandstone. We haven't quite come to it as yet. It's a little bit quieter today, but uh, our uh, tourism sector is uh, opening up more and more, and I was delighted yesterday to be guiding Joe and Lizzie, who are uh, fans of Joe and Mike's virtual tours, who've been watching us and decided to book me for a physical walking tour, which uh, I conducted yesterday off the new and old town and that was uh, very good fun. It was great fun um, to do that. So remember, once again, if you're in Edinburgh, you're looking for a tour, either Joe or myself could be available to, to guide you and give you the local knowledge, both being local guides. So now we're looking at, in the sunshine, is Edinburgh Art College. It's quite a distinctive building and it is in uh, what we call the Beaux Arts style of architecture, which means it's French inspired. It's almost like uh, French chateau towers. And it was a bit of a rebellion against a more severe architecture that was around in the Victorian times called Gothic, which was very vertical and very sharp. And uh, this um, a bit uh, refined, but not quite as refined as the Lawson Fire Station with its arts and crafts style. Um, so this um, is all about strength. The architect was uh, showing how strong a building this is just by the type of uh, geometric forms you can see there. And it's got an, an outlook over to Edinburgh Art College. Some people, and I've been inside, say that the interiors uh, of the building are better than the exteriors because they're uh, quite light and graceful inside and there's a very stunning uh, sculpture court that you can wander around there at the Art College. And a connection with Sean Connery, uh, if you're familiar with him, is the first James Bond, uh, who was born in Edinburgh and he did many jobs. He was a milkman, delivering milk around this area as well, in what's called the Fountain Bridge part of the town. And he was also a coffin polisher. <laughs> and uh, so he was a milkman, a coffin polisher, and an artist model. So he was a life model at Edinburgh Art College. So they say that uh, if you're a past student and you had uh, Sean Connery in your sketchbook, well, that uh, sketchbook could go for quite a bit of money. Okay, yeah, I was a great James Bond, sadly passed uh, not so long ago. So we're wandering down from the Art College and we're going down to the West Port, as it's called. And uh, we've got this building ahead of us. We can just see this uh, kind of uh, multi-storey block with the glass windows. And this is called Argyle House. And many people in Edinburgh do not like this building. Uh, it was a government building. It had to do with, uh, uh, like, social security at one point. And there were uh, courts in it as well, on the other side of the building. And uh, very much a 1960s block type building which uh, gets in the way of a nice view of Edinburgh Castle. So uh, very surprised they were able to put this in the position it's in. It was decommissioned as a public uh, government building and now is uh, used for various arts projects and uh, you can hire off a space in this building today and it's called Argyle House. Okay now we are looking down the street here uh, which is called Lady Lawson Street and just around the corner 
we're not actually going to go down it, but uh, maybe give you a little glimpse of it. The traffic that's coming up from the right is coming up from the grass market uh, up from what we call the West Port, and our port used to be a gateway, but uh, we'll move further down so that you can get another angle on it. It's Lady Lawson Street. Now, people, when they come to Edinburgh, they wonder why are certain streets got these names? What was significant about the, the person? Well, sometimes it is a very simple answer. It just happened to be that Lady Lawson, who was one Janet Elphinstone and was the wife of uh, James Lawson, uh, he was a politician and a lawyer and also he had been given an honour uh, and so she was uh, his, his wife and happened to be living in this area uh, the Lawsons had property here and that's why it's called Lady Lawson Street and if you're ever uh, wondering about the courses and alleyways of Edinburgh's old town you'll see uh, various uh, courses and streets with people's names like Bailey Fife's Close, if you like, uh, just because Bailey Fife happened to stay uh, at the bottom of one of these uh, accesses. So we're now walking down uh, what is called, from the Westport, we're walking down to Bread Street. You see all this sort of activity that uh, is happening and uh, here we've got the Birkin here, not forgetting these serial killers. If uh, 1828, who uh, lived not far away from here, and uh, William Hare at his uh, boarding house where he lodged, they were able to lure people, and uh, it said they killed 16 people, and the bodies were sold to Dr. Knox at Edinburgh's medical school. It was an absolute outrage of an event, uh, which is remembered. Uh, very much today and it was because Edinburgh had a very active medical school and because of the law it was very difficult for them to acquire bodies for autopsies and uh, for investigations especially uh, when it came to the central nervous system to investigate that um, so it was very lucrative but uh, we had what were called body stealers who took bodies from graveyards but we also had um, these serial killers, William Burke and William Hare, and that was Tanner's Coast, which actually was on the site of Argyle House, uh, which we had a look at earlier on when I was pointing out that 1960s uh, building there. So we're going to move further on here and I'll take a little view. And uh, many of you may have, even locals may not have, noticed uh, what's on top of this uh, dome here and it's actually a flying fish and it's in gilded bronze uh, an example of an artistic public art feature it's maybe quite difficult to identify the shape of it but believe me it's a flying fish and it was put there uh, to commemorate an Edinburgh festival uh, going back uh, to 1999 okay so this uh, block here that uh, was a department store would you believe? And it was a uh, part of the St Cuthbert's uh, Cooperative uh, no money going on over here. Society, right? Now, I'm just going to be a bit of a wander down here. So St Cuthbert's Cooperative Society, and many Edinburgh people may remember, up until the 1980s, there would be horse-drawn uh, delivery floats and this was also the St Cuthbert's, an organisation who were able to repair carriages quite late on uh, into quite recent times. So whenever the Queen's carriage needed a wheel or needed something done to it, then most likely it would be coming to uh, St Cuthbert's. Now, I'm just showing the exterior of this building, which was a department store. It was built in uh, 1892. And the thing about a cooperative was it was affordable prices. The food was always for affordable prices and the users and customers had ownership of the organisation. And it was one of the first buildings to have a glass curtain wall which was uh, put in 
in the 1930s, and you can actually see that if we move along a little bit, just behind the scaffolding, it's quite difficult to see. But what was St Cuthbert's Cooperative Society in store was, today is a, a hotel and conference centre. I talked about Sean Connery, well he worked as a milkman for St Cuthbert's uh, a dairy, because there was a dairy here as well as a bakery, and of course we've got the connection with the name Bread Street, because traditionally uh, it is thought that bakers worked out of here, and they were far enough away from the old town not to provide a hazard with the use of heat and fire, so they had to relocate out with the city walls, so there is a connection there. Now we're just going to carefully cross over the road here. The universities and colleges have opened now, so you'll be seeing quite a few students. So just a little scan of the items outside the antique shop here, and some of the items in the window too. A chance for me to say hello. You can maybe see my reflection in the glass. Okay, uh, so we're going to come around a little bit here. And we're looking at this uh, pub, which is uh, got, it's quite well known to to many of the locals here and it is uh, called the Blue Blazer. Now the Blue Blazer, it wasn't always called that, uh, this pub here. Um, it was actually called McAlpin's Bar at one point as well. Now, yeah, Freshers Week, yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and this whole block, which was erected in 1864, uh, it was called the Clan Alpine Buildings. Now you can see this whole bit of architecture here. And you can tell it's an old building too because they've got some of that nice detail uh, that you see. They've got the date uh, of the, the building just above. And this is when this wasn't called Bread Street. This is this street on the corner. It was called Orchard, Orchard Field Street. So you can see the Blue Blazer, and it used to be called McAlpin's Bar, um, and it was that up until the okay, up until eighteen eighty nine. Then it changed. It was changed to be the Clan Alpen Bar uh, before it became the Blue Blazer in a name change in the nineteen seventies. And it's it's got a good atmosphere. It's a bit like the Oxford Bar when you go in here. It's got sectioned off areas uh, where you can have a chat and maybe. Uh, get away from the noise around the bar. So it's also a real ale pub and I know there's a lot of real ale fans around also. So the blue blazer, you can see the lettering. Just as I scan up a little bit, you can see the date and then actually up there, you might have to believe me, uh, above the other window there's a little um, a medallion, a little uh, sculptural piece with the uh, thistle of Scotland and the Rose of England on it. So another look over there at the flying fish on the top of what used to be St Cuthbert's Cooperative Society shining gold there in the sunshine and we'll swing around again. So this is uh, Spittle Street today so we'll uh, just continue walking down here. This is, what's good about this too is uh, the wonderful view of Edinburgh Castle as you come down here. It's, uh, this is the very difficult bit to attack uh, going back uh, to when the castle was a fortification because it had a sheer uh, volcanic uh, drop, a sheer volcanic formation there. So the western side, which this is, was also more difficult. Uh, to attack. The eastern side was a bit easier because it uh, faced the town. And you can see this big block building up in the Castle Rock. Uh, this was uh, where the soldiers hang out. So Walter Scott, and we're celebrating his 250th anniversary this year, described it as a vulgar cotton mill, 18th century building, which didn't actually tie in very well, in his opinion, with the older architecture of the castle, the palace and the great hall, which is further around there. Um, so we can see the sets. Once again, we're going down uh, Grindley Street now. 
And we're coming uh, close to this uh, lovely theatre. You can see the white building on the right hand side here. It's got a kind of grey sky you can see but uh, we've still got sun coming and highlighting these uh, amazing venues. And the uh, Royal Lyceum Theatre uh, was opened in 1883 and is still very active today. So it's very much a Victorian theatre and uh, still hosting dramas and various companies come to perform here. Here also is the classical style, what we call, of architecture, Italian influenced, uh, not quite so heavy as the Gothic style we are talking about earlier, which uh, was also fashionable during Victorian times. And take a little swing down there, down Cornwall Street, and you've got another backdrop with the, the castle there. Now take a little bit over here. And if you look at, I'm not going to go right down towards the castle, but if you look at the sandstone coloured building, modern building, that is called Saltire Court. Now, uh, this uh, goes back to about 1992, and it was the end of a real wrangle, a real disagreement and over what was called the hole in the ground in Edinburgh. And there had been various suggestions what to put in this hole in the ground because where the Lyceum Theatre is today, and we're seeing the side of the theatre, uh, there is a concert hall and another theatre, but it was a very difficult site. It was a very restricted site, so you had to have a really clever architect or designer to put something in here and look good without uh, looking really confined. Now, when the Lyceum went up, it wasn't quite as confined, but after the big concert hall, which we're going to have a look at shortly, was put up, then it was getting really, really confined. And there had been a suggestion that for this hole in the wall, there would be an opera house. And people thought, yeah, that would be ideal, because Edinburgh didn't really have a suitable venue for large-scale productions, especially during the Edinburgh Festival. Edinburgh Festival started in 1947. Um, so it was really crying out for a big, ideally an opera house. But there were so many disagreements on the council and so on, and for lack of funding, and also because it was going to be a difficult site architecturally, it never happened. So instead of the opera house, they developed the festival theatre so they refurbished this older theatre and uh, enhanced it and so on and that is what is our informal opera house today. But you're getting a view of the Lyceum Theatre at the moment. And it has been altered. They have put this nice glass frontage in front of it and it doesn't take away from the architecture. It was early on owned by the Howard and Wyndham a theatrical company. Take a little closer look. Now they are still limiting people in here as you can see. There's only like 98 people at a time uh, to uh, protect people with uh, social distancing. I think it's rather sensible. Okay, so walk down Grindley Street. We're coming up to this uh, big glass um, curtain, curtain wall, if you like. Um, we talked about the early glass wall up at St Cuthbert's, uh, which goes back to the 1930s, but this is uh, much more recent. So this was a refurb, a refurbishment, this glass construction that you can see and uh, this happened in uh, 2002 uh, and it houses the reception area, function area and just general improves the ticket selling area of the Usher Hall.
as we can see and you can see the box office of the Asher Hall coming in into view here and we'll get us coming back a bit so this was the building after it had been built which kind of confined things for later structures to come into this part of town and the Usher Hall is uh, named after the Usher distilling, whiskey distilling gentleman called Andrew Usher and it was opened in 1914 just around at the time of the start of the First World War and uh, it was uh, all to do with uh, philanthropy all to do with uh, encouraging people's knowledge of culture and it is said that there was no alcohol allowed in the Usher Hall and he'd made his name from alcohol so maybe that you know maybe there's a message there because I think I remember when I went to the the Guinness uh, attraction in Dublin which still manufactures Guinness there was messages about the dangers of alcohol at the same time so um, quite quite an interesting character to have not allowed uh, alcohol and it, I, I think I can vaguely remember it's within my memory when they didn't actually have alcohol in here when it was only soft drinks you could actually get so Asher Hall opened in 1914 uh, there were many many people who uh, competed to get the winning design for this great concert hall and uh, it finally was chosen and it was once again quite difficult even then it was a difficult site so you had to be quite clever the, the hall itself is octagonal you may think many that it's circular because it's got a dome and that is correct but it's got eight sides and if you go inside you could probably get more a feel for the fact that it's octagonal right now it's been used for different things different events have happened here we go back to a rather unsavory event we'll take a little wander around a bit here and that was in 1934 when Sir Od Oswald Mosley uh, who was of a very right wing uh, party who was uh, having affiliations to Hitler and the Nazis uh, he came here uh, to give a speech and it was a mark of the feeling of the people of Edinburgh that thousands and thousands of people gathered outside uh, and protested from the point of view that he was uh, allowed to come here and give such uh, an address to the people. Also, it was a boxing arena in 1986. It's used for the Commonwealth Games boxing arena. It's got a very large space, of course be very suitable for that and also if you've been behind the scenes in the show oh, I have my son is performed here uh, down in the basement area which is also used just as a semi rehearsal room and gathering spot uh, is huge so it could have been a possible air raid shelter just under the floor here which many people are not aware of okay so that is the Usher Hall right. So we have got the hole in the ground that was in this area, the proposed uh, great opera house that never ever happened. But here we have got the Traverse uh, Theatre. Now, Traverse Theatre, it, it originated back in 1963 at a very small venue in Edinburgh's old town and it was very much connected with the Edinburgh Festival. It was a cutting edge uh, theatre to have uh, new productions and encourage new writing and of one of those who established it was one uh, Richard DeMarco who's still around today and is a bit of a shaker and mover in his later years still is but um, this building is 1992 the Traverse uh, Theatre as it's called now why is it called the Traverse it was a mistake because <laughs> Somebody um, thought Traverse meant something to do with a, the staging of a production 
Now, I don't know much about the staging of a theatre production, but they thought Traverse connected with a description of a particular type of staging. But it wasn't, it was transverse staging. So it was wrong. But by that time, it was too late to change the names, so it remains with us today as being the Traverse Theatre. And it's a very good building, I think, going inside especially, and there's a bar and a restaurant, and there's two, two theatres in here also. Right, so we'll move around from the Usher Hall. Another thing I didn't tell you about the Lyceum Theatre was it was the first theatre in Scotland to use electricity. Uh, remember, it was 1883 it opened, and it was also the first to have an iron safety curtain, you know, at the interval, uh, just uh, because there had been great fires and disasters backstage and the history of theatre then during the interval, they would pull down a great curtain. So it was the first iron safety curtain. That's how I see them though, but this is the Usher Hall. You can see some of the, the people who are coming as well. So we're going to move across the street. We're coming over to Lothian Road. And uh, very mixed sort of day today. It's sort of grey a little bit now, but it had been quite sunny earlier, but who knows, it might just come back. Probably will come back. So you can get a little glimpse of the, the street life as we move on here. And you can see the big orange posters painted stonework just ahead of us coming up on the right hand side. The film house is a, a historic building because you remember Dean Street when I did the tour of Stockbridge I took us past what had been a United Presbyterian Church which had been made into a cinema. Well the same thing happened here. So we've got uh, this building, which was designed in 1830. You see the one with the, the, all the orange paint on it. This was designed by David Bryce, architect. And of course, David Bryce is also known as being architect Fetis College and also had to do with the design of the Bank of Scotland building in Edinburgh as well, the old Bank of Scotland building. But this is uh, designed in a Georgian villa understated type of architecture and it remained our United Presbyterian Church then it became St Thomas's uh, Church and then it was uh, finally changed again to be the cinema uh, in 1979 now those who attended the film house going back to its early days may remember that you couldn't actually get into the front bit, the front bit, because it was a historic building and it was conserved like the bit today which is a foyer where you buy your tickets. But as time went on that changed and today uh, the whole building, the, the whole organisation is outgrowing this current building and we are planning a new film house which is going to be uh, position not very far away from here. So take a little look at this. I'm a member of the Film House. It's a charity. It's uh, the Centre for the Moving Image charity and it specialises in a lot of art house films as well as foreign language films but it also shows the shakers and movers as well. It will be showing the new James Bond film shortly but you can see what's on at the moment let you have a wee look at that everyone's everybody's talking about Jamie here other side got a cafe bar nice place for a meal as well food's very good here so coming up here and I want us to look at this uh, plaque and this is dedicated to Alistair Sim Alistair Sim is a Scottish actor you can see his dates there and uh, he started off not as an actor, but as a voice coach. And it was only in his 30s that he actually discovered himself as a stage actor and film actor, which he became later on in his, uh, his time. And uh, his uh, mother came from the island of Egg, uh, out in the Western Isles. And his father was from Edinburgh. And his father was a tailor and had a tailor shop here. 
and uh, this is where he was born, Alistair Sim. Now he went on to be a great uh, actor uh, and stage and he was also knew the, the writer, playwright James Bridie and he appeared in many of his plays on stage in the West End of London but he's also known as acting in the likes of uh, Scrooge, the Charles Dickens uh, story, play and um, also you may be familiar with him as a headmistress in the St Trinian's story uh, he, play, he went into a drag and played the headmistress uh, so as a voice coach he won many awards reciting poetry and he had a good little business uh, training people on speech and vocabulary uh, he was uh, offered a knighthood but he refused it and he had a really good stage image. He was uh, very comical uh, and also very creepy at the same time. He was um, a great, a great character, a great character actor. Yeah. So Alistair Sim uh, passed in the 1970s, but uh, he was around at the time of the Zealand comedies and the golden age of cinema, let's say. So look out for him if you haven't already seen him, especially in some of the St Trinian's films. We're coming up to another statue here. Now this uh, statue here, it's called Woman and Child, and it was put here in 1986, and it is sculpted by Anne Ross Davidson. Anne Ross Davidson connections with Aberdeen, especially Grace College of Art in Aberdeen. And uh, it is all to do with the Edinburgh's stand against apartheid. And this is the 1980s when this was put here. So it's a statement against these terrible events that were actually going on, like the fighting in the Soweto township and the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela. And uh, have a little look around the back there see the woman with the child and there's a reference to a very abstract simplified reference to a township and the corrugated iron uh, laid behind there. Now Anne Ross Davidson is quite a notable sculptor in her time, she's passed on but uh, she's also known for the sculpture of Robert the Bruce which stands outside Aberdeen Town House and uh, she also uh, sculpted an image of uh, St Margaret and uh, it was presented to Pope John Paul II and uh, she also she was just uh, well known in lots of respects and she also did another sculpture of Mary Queen of Scots so look out for that, it's also easily missed this little sculpture uh, as you walk down Lothian Road so we're going to go down to Wharves Festival Square, you can get a little view down there of the exchange area but it's the business area of uh, Edinburgh, of which Saltire Court, which I mentioned earlier, uh, also connects. And we can get a bigger view, more distant view of the Usher Hall there, with its extension. It had an organ, uh, it was well known for its organ, uh, which was out of commission for many years. The organ dates back, way back to about 1913, but it was restored uh, back in the 1980s and it's still is working today, uh, the organ of the Usher Hall. So we'll come around here. And uh, the Sheraton Hotel, this is called Festival Square. Being an artist, being a painter, I'm always going to come to public art. It's something that I really love. And uh, here we've got some example of it in front of the Sheraton. Now this is a series of uh, stone balls and uh, this is called uh, First Conundrum and it was uh, stalled here in the year 2000. There was a lot of millennium projects that went up then. Now this was by an artist called Remco Defoe who is an Irish artist and uh, it represents uh, stone carved balls which are very important uh, in the history in the archaeology of Scotland because we've got these balls that keep turning up 
and you can see them in various museums. This is obviously an artistic uh, <laughs> enlarged example of which are quite small little uh, sculpted balls which uh, can be seen and the balls the originals date back to Neolithic times it would be about 3000 BC so about 5000 years ago and the artist has uh, scattered these balls and arranged them and some of them do reference quite strongly the nature of the artwork on the ancient Neolithic examples and uh, they have these knobs and spirals and grooves right and that is how the, the the originals are marked as well we can only speculate but the knobs might actually say oh that this might be quite nice to be able to handle without dropping it so there have been certain suggestions made going back to ancient times that these could have been to do with uh, speaking stones if you were in a circle and you had some tribal uh, speeches or talks to do then you would wait your turn until the stone arrived in your hands and then that would give you the chance to talk uh, also it could be game pieces uh, they could be fishing weights or even because they're uh, quite easily handled they could have been a weapon to throw at your opponent and there's also a water feature here as well so Remke Defoe he has this installation called First Conundrum and it sits in front of the Sheraton Hotel so that ties up my tour today and I hope you've all enjoyed it and I've certainly enjoyed uh, guiding you down in this uh, very amazing part of Edinburgh. So many amazing parts to see the castle there in the distance.